Part two, two of John, John K. K. Lundwall series, series on, on astrotheology. Astro uh, this is where they determine, you know, which books are canonical. And and by the way, we don't know what they determined. Right? I mean, <laughs> we don't know what what contained in our Bible is. Uh, you, you know, the Torah is the thing that unites all. Uh, Jewish traditions, but you know we forget that at the time of Jesus, turn of the millennium, there were seventy-two different sects of Judaism in Jerusalem alone, and what united them was the Torah. They all believed in the first five books, but some of them, that's all they believed in. They rejected all other writings. Some of them, like the Pharisees, believed in the Tanakh, right? So they had the writings of the prophets and the wisdom literature, and some of them had books that aren't in our Bible at all. And so, um, you know, so there is no strict scriptural canon at the turn of the millennium except for the Torah. And this is also true with early Christianity. I mean, the, the, the Christian New Testament doesn't get canonized till, you know, the end of the fourth century. And uh, so the, the point is, as we lay these information mediums down on our biblical history, we can start see, seeing how the interpretation, the collection interpretation of Scripture evolves. And it's not till the Protestant Reformation that we actually get the Christianity with which you and I are familiar with. You know, the Protestant Reformation is the product of the printing press. They're the first movement in history that actually uses the printing press for propaganda. Luther uh, flooded you know, and, and his alkalites flooded Europe with tens of thousands of pamphlets uh, promoting the Reformation out of Catholicism. Well, you also get new translations of Bibles and you get the, the multiplicity of Bibles. And now, you know, it's not just the Catholic priest who can read the Bible. Now anyone can read the Bible. But with that, you get uh, Really, the Protestant Reformation is where you start getting the idea that everything in the Bible is literal history. Because, uh, you know, the Catholic priests uh, for centuries had been reading the Bible using different lenses, allegory, symbol, you know, parable, and history. But the Protestants rejected everything the Catholics were doing. They rejected the Catholic authority, the papal authority, and they said the only authority we now need is a text. This is radically different than the history of all religion. Uh, hmm. You know, before before the papacy, the authority you needed was the temple and the temple cult, right? It wasn't a text. It was the temple and the temple cult. That gets, trans that gets transposed to the synagogue and a text. That gets okay. transposed to an imperial structure that Rome imprints upon Christianity. And then that finally gets transposed into... Uh, just the text. That's what the Protestants do. Now all we need is the Bible. And that's why you have thousands of different Pro Protestant sects and only a couple Catholic traditions. Because when you have a centralized authority like the papacy, well, then you, you've got the thing that's going to determine the interpretation of your text. When you get rid of that and say, no, no, the text is the only authority we need, the problem with that is everyone has a different interpretation. And over a few centuries, you go from <laughs> one Protestant sect to now thousands. Uh, okay, and, John, John. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so what happened, what started off as, as being conceived of as a simplification or maybe a settling of a grand issue actually became more complicated because now with the multiplicity of texts, now we've got a situation that's more diverse and maybe more unmanageable than ever before. How did that kind of inverse uh, relationship sneak up on them from behind? Because they couldn't have seen that coming. Well, you know, the Protestants are, are tend to be quite anti-Catholic, but it turns out uh, Catholicism had a real mess on its hands. Uh, you know, again, we forget that there was there were no fax machines in the ancient world. Uh, the early Christian world, the first century Christians, you know, you had a group of Christians in this city and a group in this city and a group in this city and a group in this city. We get the New Testament mostly because we get this guy, Paul, who's writing all these letters to these different groups because Paul realizes nobody believes the same thing. <laughs> and furthermore, they have different texts that they're using. I mean, they're using the Jewish text, but 
well, they're using other texts as well. You know, we, we get all these apocrypha and pseudepigrapha, but they're using other texts that don't make it into our um, our canonized uh, New Testament. And so, um, you know, so, you know, the Catholics often get uh, criticized by Protestants because basically they voted the New Testament into existence, right? And then and, and the Protestants are saying, oh, yeah, you voted it. You know, we believe the word of God is is the power and spirit of, of revelation in the spirit of God. Well, I'm sorry, but how did you get the text, Protestants? The Catholics are the ones that went through an enormous effort of trying to find, you know, the earliest manuscripts and uh, and tried to get everyone on the same page and tried to, they did have all these councils and they were very conscientious, but, the, you know, that still means, you know, there's, there's politics involved and there's various levels of competency involved and there's greed and, you know, there's human beings involved. And so, but the bottom line is um, Catholicism creates Christianity. And had they not created Christianity, I don't think Christianity would have taken off. I mean, it, it, it was burgeoning under the, the Roman Empire, but thank goodness Constantine converted. Uh, because, but, but two things happen. Constantine converts. Christianity becomes the imperial religion. Christianity is now a world religion. And at the same time, you get, you know, this correlation occurring through all these councils, which means everything on the fringe is getting kicked out. And it turns out you might be kicking out the most important stuff. Okay. I mean, that's just, that's, that's, Mm. there's no way around it. So they're, they're, they're canonizing the text. They're standardizing the principles. They're standardizing the ecclesiastical structure. This actually saves Christianity, promotes Christianity, makes Christianity a world religion. There's huge upsides. At the same time, you're kicking out anything considered heretical or you just don't know. You just don't know, so you kick it out. Well, oh, wait, stop. That might be the thing you want, right? <laughs> and so, um, and then, you know. Is there then, an example you can give, John? Just just one example, if you have one. I'm just wondering. Well, I'll give one example that made it into the New Testament, but <laughs> no one's exactly sure what to do with it. Uh, and that's the book of Revelation, right? The last book in, in, in the book is the only book in the New Testament, the only book in the New Testament that identifies itself as Scripture. It says, do not add to this. And of course, a lot of Protestants say it's talking about the New Testament. It's not. It's talking about just the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation says, this is a sacred text. Do not add to it, which means by, you know, the end of the first century, the content of the book of Revelation was seen by the first century Christians as the Christian scriptural canon. And it turns out that's the text no one understands. Well, why, (laughs) why is that? Why, why? No, wait a second. I mean, we, we want, <laughs> we want history scripture, right? So we get the gospels, which gives us the story of Jesus. We get Paul, which gives us the doctrines, right? You know, the corrections, what people should believe, right? And then revelation comes in and it's, you know, it's, what is revelation? Well, it turns out it's cosmology, it's ritual, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's myth. It's, it's the pattern of the old religious structure. That's been retained. Uh, and, so, <laughs> and so, and what do Christians do with it? They reinterpret it as uh, historical. And so they say, well, this is all about, you know, the coming age where Christ comes again. And so it's a prophecy, the four horsemen, the apocalypse. It's a prophecy of, of future time. I would argue, gentlemen, that Revelation is a prophecy of cosmic time. Remember, mm. to oral peoples, the truth is cosmic fact, not historic fact. And what it's teaching is uh, the future time of the soul, right? It's not telling us when the nuclear war is going to happen. So in any case, what we, get, what we get with uh, the book of Revelation is, is a reflection probably <laughs> of the Christian understanding of scripture. And it's the thing we understand least. So this is rather disconcerting. Um, and this is a point, by the way, that Margaret Barker makes in uh, one of her books, that uh, the book of Revelation is probably uh, the the thing that uh, that the Christians all recognized as scripture and everything else did have to get voted on. 
So, you know, that, you know, that that's a little disturbing. Um, anyway, I, we've got to move on. I got so much stuff and we, we just keep talking about caves. And, <laughs> and, 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 you know, so uh, bottom line is uh, on this graphic you have in front of you, what happens with the uh, literatization of Christian religion, your temples become schools, your cosmology becomes science, your ritual structures become creeds. And modern Christianity, therefore, has become, in Protestant versions of it anyway, has become completely deritualized, decosmologized, desacralized, and it, it's wholly a textual affair. Well, I'm, I, I'm not condescending or uh, I'm not describing that in pejorative terms. I'm just describing what has happened, right? There's a lot of pluses that come with literate Christianity, uh, but we just have to recognize that modern Protestant variations of Christianity are going to be something entirely different than first century Christianity, which is going to be something entirely different than fourth century Judaism, which is going to be something entirely different than 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th century Judea, Israelite religion. So um, I probably should skip over this, but uh, just so that we get our feet on the ground, here are some basic differences between the mediums and how they uh, reflect between oral religion or proto-literate religion and literate religion. Uh, oral or proto-literate religion is based in nature and cosmology. Literate religion is based in doctrines and texts. Oral religion is cyclical. Literate religion is linear. Oral religion believes in cosmic truths, tells narratives about archetypal stories, which are myths. Literate religion wants only the facts. Please tell me only what happened. We want history. Uh, oral religion is tribal. Literate religion is introspective. I and thou. It's individual. Oral religion, polytheistic, monotheistic, ritual-based, text-based, temple-centered, text-centered. So um, this left column is Israelite religion. The right column is Jewish religion. So I, I divide Israelite religion with Judaism after the destruction of the temple and the creation of a sacred text. Uh, and so Jew, Judaism is literate religion. Israelite religion is oral religion. And, but we do get these patterns in early Christianity as well. The book of Revelation is there to show us those patterns still existed. Uh, and, so, and we don't know what to do with it. And that's because... Like the pyramid text, the book of Revelation is a whole stack of epithets, metaphors, symbols, uh, which all are describing the cosmology, ritual, and myth of the center of the cult, of the early Christian belief system. What I just said, by the way, a lot of scholars would disagree with. So, you know, just know that. John, are, yeah. are, you, are you saying that there's a conceivable parallel universe, if you will, where there's nothing but the type of writing we see in the book of Revelation, where that would have been more the norm instead of the exception. That's, that's mind blowing. <laughs> um, well, yeah, actually, uh, we get a similar book in the old Testament called Ezekiel. And we don't know what to do with that, but it's, it's describing uh, a temple cosmology. Ezekiel and Revelation are connected in that way. And of course, if you've read any of the books of Enoch, um, you know, look, the Dead Sea Scrolls have the, the, the number one uh, prophet that is written about in the Dead Sea Scrolls is copied through the Dead Sea Scrolls is, is, is Isaiah. OK, we would expect that because Isaiah is really beginning this literate tradition within Judaism before the Torah is written. Um, but the second most pro, uh, most mentioned or cited prophet in the Dead Sea Scrolls is Enoch. What? What? Wait, stop. What? What? Where did he come from? Enoch gets, you know, two or three verses in Genesis, and that's all we know about him. And yet he <laughs> is uh, throughout the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, you know, all we know about Enoch is the late manuscripts that have been found that are books of Enoch. And what are they? They're the book of Revelation. And it's just all cosmology and ritual. Um, and, and no one knows how to interpret Enoch. Right. He has this heavenly journey and he 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 goes to the temple in heaven where he receives the knowledge of, of God and, and the knowledge of time and past, present and future. It, it's very revelation esque. Well, the Essenes appear to be practicing. I mean, their conceptual religion lives in that world. 
and uh, and we've lost that world because it's it's not the literate cognitive model in which modern Christianity exists. And so we just lost that world. So yes, uh, Luther, to answer your question, um, there was a time when uh, revelation was more the norm than a- anything else. And but that time has passed. So now we've moved on. And um, and so there you have it. Um, all right. Now I'm ready to engage into this uh, next part, which is what you wanted to, to, me to engage in, which is astrotheology. Are, are you ready to yes. go for this? Yes. <laughs> hey, ladies and gentlemen, just so you know, the show is now beginning. <laughs> oh, the, yeah, that's true. Let's do it. <laughs> oh, we're finally beginning the show. Well, that, that previous hour was just answering Ann's question. I, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Please you, limit your questions, people. <laughs> um, all right. Look, um, this is a very interesting question. You, you asked me to speak on astrotheology and is the astrotheology in the Bible. Uh, most biblical scholars, I think, would say no, uh, by the way. Let's just define what astrotheology is. I have here on the top bullet just the dictionary definition. Theology founded on the observation or knowledge of celestial bodies. And if you look up astrology uh, astrology in Wikipedia, astrology is astrotheology in polytheistic systems. You read, the Hebrew Bible contains repeated references to astrology. Well, it turns out it does. Deuteronomy 4 and 17 contains a stern warning against worshiping the sun, moon, stars, or any of the heavenly hosts. Relapse into the worshiping of the host of heaven, the stars, is said to have been the cause of the fall of the kingdom of Judah in 2 Kings. Well, so what does that mean? Did the Israelites practice astral theology? Well, the text tells us they did. Uh, so, that I mean, that settles the issue, right? But uh, I think most uh, uh, religious scholars would say that was an aberration. They kept going to the pagan cult systems around them, which was filled with astral theology, which is true. And so, uh, and so, but Israelite religion itself was a rejection of astral theology. I would argue against that. I would argue against that because as, as we just learned, oral cognitive models require mapping memories onto the stars and planets, as well as to the trees and rivers and rocks uh, by which they maintain their calendar and their cult system, right? And so you right. automatically are synthesizing uh, the heavens with your religious uh, conceptions. I mean, this just happens automatically. If you live in an oral society, and quite frankly, for most of Israelite history, you know, about less than 10 or even 5% of the population could read or write. So this was going on, and, th- and this is why the Bible keeps saying, hey, stop worshiping the host of heaven, because the Israelites kept doing it. <laughs> and they kept doing it because uh, they were hardwired to do it. That's what oral peoples do. Um, so, but now I'm going to give some examples outside of the Bible. Uh, by, uh, I, I think this is very instructive. Here I have two pictures of, you know, the, the left one is this. These are the icons of the religious face of Judaism and Christianity. If you could sum up Judaism in one picture, what would you show? Well, there's a few pictures you might show, but inevitably Moses with the Ten Commandments receiving the vision and revelation on Sinai is the thing you would show. And what does Moses come down from the, the mountain with? He comes down with a text. <laughs> And so this is, this is, you know, wow, it's, it's not only a text, it's a text written by God, right? By the finger of God. Well, this is a huge transition. And might I argue, you know, I said in the last podcast, the story of the Exodus probably is patterned off of, off of a temple ritual, right? And which means the original thing that Moses came down with probably wasn't a text. It was a ritual cycle. A cosmological cycle, but you know, right, it's a right. religion now, and so we're going to come down with the text. And I don't mind that because it turns out the text Moses comes down with is pretty freaking genius. And we can talk about that later. I mean, it's just 10 simple statements that no one wants to live by. Uh, but if we did, we would solve almost all of our problems. But you know, <laughs> but Moses was an ignorant goat herder, so we don't have to think about it. 
Um, all right, so you have that image. And then uh, in Christianity, you have, of course, uh, the crucifixion. That is the icon of faith for Christians. And this isn't a text, but it is, you know, it's history, right? Both of these are seen as historical events, and uh, they are the icons of faith. Well, let me show you a different icon of faith. The leading religion in Rome as Christianity was growing was Mithraism, based off the god Mithras. Almost all of the legionnaires in the Roman armies were Mithraists. In fact, uh, Mithraism was an all-boys club. You had to be male in order to be initiated into it. But females would be initiated into other mystery religions uh, as corollaries to the initiations of Mithraism. What do we know about Mithraism? And, you know, sadly, almost nothing. There are no texts. Even in this literate Roman world, the, the, the truth was, if you publish, you will perish. And that was true of all the mystery religions, and so you could not reveal what was going on because it was thought to be so sacred. What we learn about the Greco-Roman mysteries turns out to be from later Christian writers who were writing about them to criticize them so, you know, maybe we shouldn't be taking everything these writings tell us as fact, because, you know, if someone's writing about your religion to criticize it, they're probably going to get a lot wrong because they're writing from a completely different perspective. Well, this uh, motif in front of us is called the Troctony scene, and it's the standard icon of faith of Mithraism, the leading religion in Rome. And ironically, I mean, good grief, in the first of the fourth century, if you were to tell a Roman that you know, within a century or two, Mithraism will have disappeared from the earth and Christianity will be the imperial world religion, they would laugh at you. They would probably execute you for blasphemy. They would probably crucify you for being such an idiot. But that's what history had. That's what history mm -hmm. gave us. Uh -huh. You just can't. You, what, no one saw it coming. No one saw it coming at all. Well, so here is the icon of Mithraism. And I just want to point a few things out. Here at the top, you see these figures. These are the symbols of the zodiac. There's Gemini, Taurus, Aries, there's Pisces. Here's the scales, right? So Mithras, the god Mithras is seen kneeling on a bull. Uh, this is the Parian marble, the famous inscription. But the, the Tarakhtini scene we're looking at is a standard scene that you find in various Mithraic temples. Uh, he's stabbing the bull in the shoulder blade, which is really interesting. It's not a killing blow. It's not a stab to the heart. It's not slitting the throat. But the bull is always surrounded by other icons. You have this scorpion that's always below it. You have the serpent that's below it. You have a dog. You have a raven here to the left. And there's a cup or a crater, a drinking cup, which isn't in this. It's on this, but it's not in this depiction right here. It's off screen. And then you have, you know, you have these personifications, these heads. These are the four corners, the four winds, the four breasts, the four corners. You know, this is your tem of your temple, right? The quadrated cross that defines your sacred space, your sacred season, your sacred cosmos. Well, you don't have to uh, <clears throat> know too much to immediately recognize that what we're looking at here is astronomical, is astrotheological. In fact, this uh, scorpion down here, this serpent, this dog, this raven, these are all constellations. This is, uh, tar the bull is Taurus, the scorpion is Scorpio, the dog is Canis Major, Hydra, Crater the Cup, Corvus the Crow, Leo the Lion. In looking at the icon of Mithraism, you are looking at a stellar tableau, a snapshot of the sky. And this is the part of the sky you're looking at. The part of the sky between Taurus and Scorpio, that's, you know, Leo is on the ecliptic, but most of these other constellations are below the ecliptic, below the celestial equator. And um, and something is going on. Whoop, oh, sorry. I'm not supposed to reveal that. <laughs> All right. The worlds are going to end. Something is going on in Mithraic initiation that is relating the, the sacred aspects of the eternal nature of the soul to the star and constellation. What is that about? What are they doing? Look, scholars have been arguing for this for decades, and because there are no texts, no one really knows. I have some 
I have my own theories on it, and I have my own uh, shots at it that I think are at least really good hypotheses. Um, and maybe we'll get in. Yeah, we will get into that here in, in a little bit. But the point is that I'm, I'm making that with Christianity, you get a text and historical event that is at the center of your faith. In all the religions in Rome, you get something completely different. You get astrotheology. Um, and their uh, religious initiations are connected to the, to the stars. You know, in Mithraism, there are seven grades of initiation. Each one is compared to a planetary sphere. Uh, you, you have this great document, uh, the Mithras Liturgy, which scholars argue over, but Hans Bader uh, Dieter Betz uh, did a definitive discussion of this ancient magical scroll that's written in uh, Mithraic cosmology. And the, uh, the scroll is, a, is a, an initiation, and the title of the initiation is, quote, Ritual for immortalization. This is how one gains eternal life, becomes immortal. And the entire uh, motifs in the scroll is about the initiate rising up to the stars, becoming one of the stars, uh, meeting the pole lords, meeting Mithras himself in an embrace where he joins the eternal realm through a, a sort of celestial journey. Here we're getting, by the way, something that's much closer to the book of Revelation than any other book in the New Testament. Something that's much closer to the book of Ezekiel than anything else in the Old Testament. Here we're, get, here we're getting what Enoch does. Enoch travels through the heavens, uh, learns the powers of the heavens, and brings those powers back to earth uh, to give beneficial powers and also to obtain his salvation. So we do have iterations of this kind of religiosity in the Judeo-Christian record, but it's been purged out of the literate tradition. And being that the Judeo-Christian religion is a literate tradition, it's, it's now non-canonical. It's outside of what we understand or accept. Um, any questions? I have a I statement. I have a statement. Yeah, I totally disagree that those should have been left out. <laughs> There's so much to glean. Uh, Luther has, you know, me and him have bounced on Enoch for a while, but he's done a lot of thorough analyzing of Enoch. And there's so much you're bringing up that makes so much sense with all of this being said. I don't want to rabbit trail off of this. Um, I, I, I really, I could see this uh, being factual, you know, and making a lot of sense in light of all this stuff. But you have such a satellite angle is what I love about it because you're looking at the big picture. You're seeing things like most scholars will like they dig into one field very, very well. And then it's like, what about how that connects to this and that connects to that? You do a really good job. I, I like that. I just wanted to make that statement. And uh, uh, just a heads up, we've got about 45 minutes just to let you guys know. Oh, uh, we're screwed. None of you are going to be saved tonight. Sorry. <laughs> All gone to hell. <laughs> we, we need to switch in order to be saved then. in order to be saved Derek you need, I need 50 minutes <laughs> <laughs> well we can give you 50 minutes <laughs> take it take it John this is so exciting I don't want to miss a bit <laughs> all right well look Derek just uh, to respond I am a big picture guy um, and uh, it's true you know you, you uh, uh, there is advantages and disadvantages to each you, I, I like to see the forest for the trees, but it turns out if you look at the forest long enough, you start losing focus on some of the individual trees, and you need to know those. Whereas if you spend your entire career looking at an individual tree, you don't see the forest. And so I tend towards big picture things, and I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing conceptual work on information mediums and how oral societies, <laughs> how oral societies pass things down, and it explains so much of the ancient myth and rich myth and religious systems which is what i you know the point is and by the way here's my next graphic my next page yeah we just looked at the icon of mithraism and it turns out to be uh really a pattern of all ancient religious structures because all ancient religious structures have emerged from that oral imprinting press of temple, cosmology, myth, and ritual. 
And so, you know, no matter what tradition you go, even in the traditions within literate Rome, your mystery, your Greco-Roman mystery religions are still participating in the old uh, sacral cosmological structures because they've been passed down for centuries. Remember, we only get fully literate religion when Judaism gets their temple destroyed, right? They, they lose Jerusalem. They get slaughtered. And, and John, in just yeah. saying, that is a show we must have. I mean, this is me and Luther are big on this temple thing right now. You know, we've been bouncing around just to give you the general idea. We're willing to go wherever the evidence leads. And because we find out about a mythology, we're digging into that. We started questioning if any of this stuff really happened. We're like, okay, it's loaded with mythology. Did it really happen? And so, you know, now we're like, we're like, okay, yes, there's really some concrete to this, but it's mythologized. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, we're bouncing around, brother. And, and that's a show we need to do on on the temple. And the fact that the first and the second temple were both destroyed on the same day, according to the Jewish calendar. There's something going on here. And you're the guy. I think you're the guy, man. Actually, mm -hmm. Margaret Barker mm -hmm. would be the excellent scholar to talk about that because she tries to re reconstruct the temple tradition out of the biblical text, which is enormously difficult to do um, because it's been purged out of the text. But, um, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to give a presentation about that. And I'll just uh, cite some of the insights of Margaret Barker. And lots of, you know, again, a lot of scholars will disagree with Barker, disagree with me. Uh, because they're, you know, they're looking at their literate trees, and I'm, I'm stepping back, and I'm saying, this is what history has given us, um, and so uh, we can safely uh, assume that early re Israelite religion had far more in common with their Mesopotamian and Egyptian neighbors than they do with modern Judeo-Christian tradition. Of course, that's true. Wow. And so uh, we, we just have to understand why and what changed and what happened. Well, that's what I'm talking about tonight. Um, in any case, um, I, these are just different Great. pictures of, uh, of, of different traditions. This is an Orphic uh, ritual bowl. This is a Mesopotamian uh, uh, calendar marker, property marker. There's a ziggurat. There's a coffin text. And there's the Greek Sphinx. You know, I, again... Um, we we accidentally get a fra a Greek fragment of writing uh, from a guy named Heraclides of Pontus. He's a Pythagorean, um, and uh, we don't get his writing. We get a, a writing of someone writing about his writing. And uh, in this writing, we learn, according to Heraclides, that there are certain stars in the sky or roads in the sky that the soul travels on. Uh, when it gets born into this material world and when it leaves this material world. And he identifies the constellations where these roads are at. One is near Scorpio, one is near Leo, and one is near Aquarius. Well, if you look at that bottom left figure, that is the uh, depiction of the Greek Sphinx. The, the scorpion serpent, which is the tail, the human head, and uh, the Leonide body, Right. And it turns out the Greek Sphinx was almost always found at tombs. It was the guardian of the soul as it traveled into the next world. Well, if we get if we take this fragment of Heraclides, uh, then we learn that the Sphinx is sort of the icon of how the soul journeys into the next world. It is a sort of equivalent of the Mithraic. Uh, Tarochtony. It's an icon of astral theology, and they planted that at the at the gravesite or at the tomb as a symbol that the person who died knew the correct paths in the afterlife. Also, the symbol was a guardian. So if you didn't, if you weren't properly initiated, or if you didn't know the correct paths, the the Sphinx and would destroy you. Your soul wouldn't pass, be able to pass the correct roads. And so it was a guardian. But the whole point is here we have uh, here we here we have uh, another astrotheological motif 
that's embedded in ancient cultures and it, it descends from Egypt and has corollaries in Mesopotamia. Uh, so this goes back a very long time, thousands of years. So the point is, is all these religious structures uh, take place within this uh, this oral religious template that has a, that existed before the invention of writing, right? The, you know, the pharaohs didn't invent the pyramid texts. They inherited them, but they weren't texts. They were this, this oral and printing press, and they innovated it and turned it into texts and grand structures of pyramids and temples uh, where they could perform these texts, but the, the texts themselves were literally performed, and and it's based off this old tradition that was passed down over thousands of years. And so I mean, this is true of all the religious structures. The Greeks didn't invent Greek mythology. They inherited it, but they uh, adapted it and innovated it and made it substantively Greek. And so, and, and so there you have it. So, you know, that, what that tells us is the Israelites innovated a prior religious form uh, that would have been conceptually in the world we're looking at here. But by the time they become literate and lost the temple, it, it turns into something else. John, on that note, because I yeah. know you're going into something else here, um, syncretism, okay? It seems to me this ties in with – I, I keep getting this picture in my head that astrological motifs – in all of this, the way that they framed it in an oral mind, the reason we find the same uh, – if you were to talk about a human body, we find the same type of bone structure okay, in all human bodies right. uh, right. is because they're all based off of this same template. It doesn't mean that they're the same story. There's uh, – this is why we see syncretism, if that makes sense. And there's varying degrees of how this might play out in different myths. But would you agree that that's what we're actually seeing here? And is the – another question, I hate to hit you with another one, but I kept thinking of the Egyptian sphinx. And I was thinking, well, what in the world is the Egyptian sphinx? Because now you got me really – oh, goodness, I'm, I'm going to mess you up. I know I am. I don't mean to. <laughs> no, hey, if you want to read about the Egyptian sphinx and myth and cult, uh, read the chapter of Heracles in my book Mythos and Cosmos. It's It's – pretty darn genius <laughs> you know, <I'm> saying, <laughs> saying so myself <laughs> um, love it love um, it look um uh, i'm I, yes so this uh, graphic we have this is the structure of oral religion and it and, and that structure exists all through the pagan period okay the pre-western period um and so it's big picture though and what you get is different innovations and adaptations in every different society. And so the Egyptians are going to do something different with what they have inherited. And of course, Egyptian religion is 3,000 years. And over that 3,000 years, Egyptian religion evolves. And so, you know, the Egyptian religion of the Ptolemaic era is not going to be the same as the Egyptian religion of the first dynasties. Uh, and so, but every culture then adopts this structure because it's a structure that their brains think in. It's their structure that the brains are wired in. But but the content of it, right, the, the, the message, this is the medium. The message is going to be slightly different in every culture as they adapt it to localized events and localized uh, concerns. And so, um, you know, so we have to be careful in uh, – homogenizing all stories and myths into representing the same thing. That's not what I'm doing. What I'm doing is saying they come from the same structure, a cognitive structure of virality. That's the medium. And then the medium changes with the invention of writing and the medium has another massive change with the invention of the reductive uh, phonetic scripts. And then it changes again with the invention of the printing press and these changes actually reformat religions entirely, practically. And so, uh, so we can sort of follow the contours of these changes as we look look at how different societies use the that they live in. Um, so I don't know how much time we have left, but now none of us are going to get saved. Uh, um, uh, John, John, take I, it. Take, yeah. take as much time. Take as much time as you need. So, so 
what happens to the immutable soul? Religion is changing, but presumably there is some substrate of the human being that maybe is constant throughout all of this. So how are we supposed to grasp this? In other words, what happens to the nature of the eternal, whatever that is, the immutable and the eternal in in light of uh, the constant reformation of how we conceptualize it? Well, Luther, that is a $100,000 question, $100 million question. Actually, there's no <laughs> price you can put on that question. Um, look, look, the eternal remains. And yes, it's true. Uh, you know, like all the scholars feeling a different part of the elephant, over history, we grab different aspects of the eternal and try to synthesize it in different ways. But, uh, you know, I think there's an excellent argument to make that human nature doesn't change the way we access uh, our own nature that doesn't change uh, human interiority that you know our brains get rewired but um, good and evil yeah. doesn't change and so right. um, and so in every culture you get people struggling with the the great questions you know they're actually called the terrible questions you know <laughs> what is the soul is there life after death who am i i mean that's a terrible question uh -huh. no one wants to answer uh -huh. because you know your name and your social class and your bank account doesn't describe who you are luther who are you you know who am i if, if i have a soul and it's eternal wow that changes everything everything wow, wow. um you know, and this all goes into, I mean, this is a total, this is way off our, uh, our subject. But you know what? I'm going to go for it. Uh, and um, uh, yes, because uh, quite frankly, I'm talking about the transition from, from this uh, structure here we have in front of us to literate religion. But the literate Bible still gives us some genius insights that address the eternal. I mean, and, and it's genius. You, you, you hear uh, people like Richard Dawkins, and you know what? I like Dawkins and Hitchinson and Sam Harris. I mean, I don't agree <laughs> with them, but I, they're smart guys, and I, I, I enjoy reading and their stuff and listening to what they have to say. I, I, I think you know, Dawkins tends to be very sloppy when it comes to the Bible. I, I, I personally don't think he's really read it. Uh, but, you know, he, one of his things is the Bible was written by a bunch of goat herders, and, you know, we have so passed beyond that with our, you know, stock markets and microchips. Well, why do we have to pay attention to the Bible? I mean, th that was written for society with goats, right? So that's his argument. Boy, does he miss the point. That, what, what are you, actually, what are you even talking about? The Bible isn't a, a, a text on science. If, if it were, then uh, Dawkins is right. We don't need to pay attention to it at all. But it's not a book on science. It's not a book on uh, modern economic systems. It's a wisdom book. And wisdom is attached to the eternal. That doesn't change. What we learn is wisdom is very hard to get. And it doesn't matter if you're a goat herder or a stockbroker or a uh, astrophysicist or a PhD in comparative religions. There is no guarantee that any of you have wisdom. And if a goat herder did get wisdom, you Preach better it. damn well listen. Because if Indeed. you jettison the wisdom <laughs> that he's obtained, you do it at your own peril. And it turns out some of these stories in the Bible were not created by the Israelites. They were inherited by the Israelites. These stories have been passed wow. down for thousands of years with great effort and great sacrifice and great suffering. And, and they're being retained. Why are they being retained? Because they're the eternal nature of the human condition. And we throw them away at our own peril, and we do throw them away. Let me just give one example. And again, I'm really off off on a completely different thing, but you asked the question, Luther, so shame on you. Uh, <laughs> but um, what what is the first story about the first human being in the Bible? In, in the book of Genesis, what is the first story of the first human being? Do, do you know? Well, yes, it's the Garden of Eden story, isn't it? 
I, so that, that's what I would think. But it turns out Adam and Eve are not human beings. They're not born from the womb. They're archetypes of human beings, right? Adam's created by clay. Eve is created by a rib. They're not even put on this planet or this earth, right? They're put in a sacral space, a garden, which is something different. It's guarded by cherubim and a flaming sword, right? And so Adam and Eve are the archetypes of humanity, the prototypes of humanity. They're not the first human beings in the Bible. Who are the first human beings in the Bible? Cain Derek, and Abel. you take that one. Yeah. Cain and Abel. Yeah. All right, so here's what happens. This is what the Bible gives us. The curtain opens. We have this majestic, grand, glorious creation scene where God himself creates the earth. And then the first story of the first human beings is about murder for gain. And it's not only about murder for gain, it's about filial murder for gain, a brother killing a brother with a rock. <laughs> what happened? And then the first story after that about the first human civilization. We get the first human beings, the first family, and it's a story about murder. And then we get the next story about the first city-state, and it's the story of Noah, right? And blood and horror is drenching the earth. It's so bad, the God who just created this miraculous creation looks down, and he can say only one thing. Dope! <laughs> <laughs> it is it is it's right, terrible yeah. right well look this is this is rather genius uh what we're being shown this is the first out of all the stories to pick about introducing humanity the writers of the uh tanakh or old testament pick these ones and they're ones that have been probably handed down for thousands of years before there is even an Abraham, because generation after generation, people have noticed something about the eternal nature of human nature. And that is we, each of us are filled with good and evil and you have to pay attention to it. You have to look at it because if you don't, evil will take over. One of the transcendent themes in the Bible miraculously is all human activity exists within entropy, all of it. The individual, the society, the government, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're a goat herder or if you're a, a postmodernist a lecturer in a, at Harvard or Oxford. It doesn't matter. All your human systems exist within entropy, and you have to look at it or else evil takes over. And if you don't look at it, sure enough, sooner or later, brother is going to be killing brother. This, by the way, is a contradiction to the modern secular view. The biblical view is not the modern secular view. The biblical view is attached to eternal archetypes of stories that have been handed down for thousands of years. And the modern secular view is something new. The modern secular view is, uh, you know what? The human being is essentially good. And all we need to do is reformat society. If we have the right bureaucracy, the right government, the right social program, we can create the utopia. Well, this is a conflict of visions, uh, um, and so the, the biblical view is not the modern secular view, and, and and therefore you have to make a choice: do I go with the goat herder, or do I go with Richard Dawkins? <laughs> and I am proposing to you, uh, actually, the safe bet is the goat herder. That's the safe bet because that's that story has been passed down for thousands of years. That's thousands of generations of people who are passing down the eternal nature of human nature. So you pay attention to it and don't lose it. Well, all right, right. All right. So, um, <laughs> look, this has nothing to do with astrotheology. This is about, you know, uh, transcendent themes that are picked up in the Bible and passed down in the Bible that are retained even in the literacy of the Bible. And they're very important. That's why, I mean, to this day, the Bible is a wisdom text. And, and, and so, again, if a goat herder has wisdom that we need, we better pay attention. It doesn't matter if he or she is a goat herder. The vocation is irrelevant. I mean, wisdom has nothing to do with smart. Without One of the, uh, you know, story after story in the Bible is about smart people without wisdom. You know, David is yes. this glorious, righteous person, and he ends up being this horrible king. Uh, because he he lost 
he he didn't keep his eye on the ball. He he dropped the goat herder and he said, I'm going to go with Dawkins. Right. And the next thing you know, cats and dogs are living together. Uriah is killed. An entire platoon of people. are. He's a mass murderer. And the, the uh, kingdom starts tearing itself apart. Well, well, that's history, people. And that's the that, that's the grand drama of human being that the Bible presents. And I think it's a very sobering and yet uh, insightful critical view that that is worth retaining anyway that, I'm, I'm done with my soapbox I, you can edit all of that out if you want and i can ah, get back to awesome, astrotheology awesome, <laughs> awesome. no you absolutely in fact what we're going to do john is because you because you offered the question for a hundred million dollars and you answered it <laughs> to a sufficient i think sufficient we'll just pay you in an additional 30 40 minutes how about that Oh, oh, all right. right. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Go for it, John. <laughs> all right. Well, um, I, I, I'm just saying, you know, the, we're de- we have jo- genre confusion when it comes to these sacred texts and and uh, it, we're constantly misaligning the genre and the origin of the text and what it is. And even the atheists do it. Uh, they're they're making arguments against a text that doesn't exist. I mean, it's the text they've created to make an argument against, and, and which is fair because it turns out, you know, a lot of believers do the same thing. So, I mean, this is what we do. It's human nature. Um, all right. So, astrotheology. We've talked about uh, Mithraism, but it turns out to be a, a system of religious structure. We find astrotheology in Egypt. We find it in Mesopotamia, we find it in Mycenae, we find it in the Greco Roman mystery religions. Uh, I would argue we certainly find it in early Israelite religion uh, because it's, that's what it is. And we probably find it in early Christianity. We do have some major problems, though, guys. I mean, um, the Bible has been purged of all these motifs. So, if you, if you were to ask me, show me proof beyond reasonable doubt that astrotheology is in the Bible, I couldn't do it. I, I what, what we get in the Bible is uh, echoes and scraps uh, because it's been reformatted. And and for, not only has it been reformatted, but, you know, we're reading it in an English translation, which reformats it. I mean, and it doesn't matter if you have a, a German or Spanish translation. It's not the original Hebrew. We don't even know what the original Hebrew was. The earliest Hebrew manuscripts we have are the Dead Sea Scrolls. And if you, you know, and a lot of the Dead Sea Scrolls deal with uh, <laughs> something that's very different from our conceptual uh, uh, view of religion. And so... Um, uh, the, the bottom line is uh, Christianity is the first world religion that begins in full literacy. And it's the first world religion that begins by being managed by tax. Judaism invented that, right? They created that after the destruction of their temple. But Christianity inherits the tradition of the Jews, their literate tradition, and it starts out as a literate tradition. Well, they're still going to have I, I would argue they're still going to have secret initiations and cosmological structures. That's still the conceptual world of the turn of the millennium. The book of Revelation is a testament to that. Um, but uh, it's going to be very hard to prove. Well, you asked me to talk about astrotheology in the Bible. And so I, what I did is I uh, emailed you a couple of papers. that was uh, published in Cosmos and Logos, Journal of Myth, Religion, and Folklore. Uh, On the left is uh, the author John McHugh, How Orion's Ability to Walk Upon the Sea Was Ascribed to Jesus. He wrote an article. I should uh, say uh, John McHugh, he's a very smart guy. He got his master's in Near Eastern Studies. Uh, He's a trained archaeologist, and he's on my archaeoastronomy team. I met this guy through our academic arguments over these papers. (laughs) And and he actually lives in Salt Lake City, and so we, we met at the library uh, he loves going to the library. I love going to the library. We met at the library and we had our our discussions and arguments. We've become friends, <laughs> and and so now he's he works with me with uh, Southwestern petroglyphs and astronomy. But so he wrote a paper, uh, and basically, the the thrust of his paper can be summarized in in two precepts. Uh, 
the gospel, there are three gospel accounts about Jesus walking on water, and they have radical differences in them. And he believes, one, the gospel accounts uh, descend from two esoteric systems in the ancient world. The first being that the 48 classical constellations of the Greeks were thought to be historical events. This is true. Many Greeks believed that the constellations were a, a form of history, uh, that things happened in the ancient past and then they were memorialized in the stars. Uh, the other thing is a bit more esoteric. It's called Mesopotamian heaven writing or constellation writing, Lumashi, Lumashti. Um, and basically, uh, Mesopotamian scribes recognized that, I mean, this is where we get astrology in the first place. They recognized that certain stars had archetypal powers over the earth. And why would they think that? Well, quite simply, this is part of the oral imprinting press. You see a certain star rise on the horizon, and when it does, uh, the Nile floods. When it does, this plant grows. When it does, uh, that fruit is ready to be picked. As these stars rise and set through the season, all sorts of changes are happening on the earth. Well, in oral cultures, they analogize that with what's causing these changes on the earth just happens to be the stars. It's that star right there that rises that, and at the same time this plant grows, that star must be influencing this plant. That's how they thought. Now, you know, we can say that's, that's incorrect, but I'm just saying this is how the birth of astrology occurs. People start recognizing heaven-earth relationships because oral peoples pour all their intellectual re, uh, resources into observing nature, and they created a science. Now, astrology we, isn't modern science to us. In fact, we kind of laugh at it, but astrology is oral science. They used all the same methodologies of science, observation, testing, hypotheses, uh, to create a, this massive astrological network where they tried to create heaven-earth correspondences, and then they had the insight, hey, we can may even foretell the future if we pay attention to the stars, because the stars themselves are a form of writing, and they called it writing, Lumashi. And, and so it was the divine writing of the gods. That's what they thought the stars and constellations were. And there was a, a esoteric system where the name of a certain constellation uh, would have several puns attached to it, homophones, uh, words that sound the same, spelled differently, etc. And it's through those puns that you could create uh, associations uh, that might prognost prognosticate what was going to happen in the battle. But for the, for the sake of John McHugh's uh, thesis, he asserts that through the punning of Mesopotamian constellation writing, we get all the motifs of the story in the New Testament, Jesus walking on water.